Amen. Well, it's good to see you. Go ahead and have a seat. We're doing a series called Need to Know. And I'm trying to go through all of the basic teachings of Christianity that are really important for us to emphasize and understand that if we, if we don't understand these things, then a whole lot of other things don't make sense to us. So it's my intention to work our way through the basic teachings of the scripture. Last week, I uh, talked quite a bit about the Bible and why the Bible is the basis for what we believe. I probably went too deeply into it. I think I intimidated some people. So let me really give it to you in a short, descriptive few sentences. The Bible is our basis for truth. It's our measure for truth. We have to have some objective standard to decide what's true and what isn't outside of ourselves. So if we don't trust this book, I don't know of anything else that's, that can compare to it in terms of being respected and appreciated and seeing the fruit come from it for thousands of years. And at some point though, we just have to decide, I'm not going to cut the Bible up and decide which parts of it I believe and which parts I don't. I'm just going to accept it. I'm going to accept those things that maybe I don't even understand. Just because the alternative to that is to not have any basis for truth. And so to have a basis for truth, it, it all starts with the Word of God, the Bible. As we talked about you know, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is, it's God-breathed, and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness to equip us thoroughly for everything that we need to do in life. And so that was Paul's evaluation of it. Peter, as we looked at last week, talked about the scriptures being written as holy men of God, spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So, you know, last week maybe I spent a little too much time elaborating on that or, you know, continuing to hammer it home. But I do want you to understand that the books that we have in our Bible are reliable. These, these are the books that have universally been accepted as the Word of God um, for thousands of years. In the case of the Old Testament, uh, 500 years or so before Jesus, up until today, the Jews have always acknowledged that these books are the ones that belong in the Bible. And all of the, in the New Testament era, in the first few centuries, there was no question about the veracity and dependability of those Old Testament books. And within 150 or so years, pretty much everyone in the church acknowledged that the Bible that you have before you is actually the Bible that is, is God's teaching to mankind. It's something that can be trusted. I went way into detail about how we know that and some of the criticisms of that, and you can go back and listen to that one if, if you're interested more in that. But I just want to remind us that we are making the assumption that this book is from God. It's God's word. And as I said, as I closed the study off last week, I said, <coughs> I'm assuming that the Bible is without error, but I'm assuming that I have lots of error. And so I want to know the difference between I'm not going to change what the Bible says, but I need to be open that some of the things that conclusions that I come to about what the Bible means, I could be wrong because good people who agree that this is the inspired, inerrant word of God, still disagree on a lot of the interpretations of it. My interpretation isn't important. Someday I'll die, and pretty soon nobody will even remember who I was. But this book will go on. And as Jesus said, not one jot or tittle is going to fail. And so it's this book that we, we don't worship the Bible but we use the Bible as our basis for epistemology, as our basis for knowing what truth is. So it's important for us to state that right off the top. 
and to understand that. So this week, I want to talk with you a little bit about where we came from, or creation, and how things went wrong. And that's called the fall, the fall of mankind. So we will look at Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 to see what the Bible says about <clears throat> where we came from and what it says further about where we messed up and how we got the, how did we get from a perfect world that God saw it was good and the world that we live in today. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 begins, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There are only two um, basic convictions that I can think of about where this earth came from. One, that it was created, that it was the object of design and, a, and the work of an intelligent creator, or that it just randomly happened through a long series, billions of years, fortuitous circumstances, mutations that seem to have benefits to them. And basically, there are a few other ideas. Some people would say that, you know, that it evolved, but there was, you know, some, something programmed into it or some sort of intelligence that was involved. But basically, we, in understanding everything else in the Bible, we either decide that what we see and who we are is an object of a creative act of an intelligent being, or that we are just here accidentally, that this just happened. And so right off the bat, Moses opens with that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If we don't believe that, in fact, God created the heavens and the earth, but instead we just believe that it just sort of happened, it changes everything in our lives. It changes who we are. If I'm, if I'm an accident, then there's really no purpose or point to life. If everyone just sort of developed accidentally, then there's no real reason for any sort of moral code or anything else. You might as well just, you know, if it's survival of the fittest, you might as well just get what's good for you. There's really no reason to, you know, have a moral code if we, we developed accidentally. If there is a God, in fact, who created the world, number one, it means that everyone has significance and everything has significance, but it also means that we are indebted to a creator, that the one who made us, who designed us, has a right to tell us who we are and what we are here for, what's the purpose as to why we are alive. And so this is really critical for us to decide. And basically, I can't prove it to you. We could go into a lot of things that would show the likelihood, the probability that life as we know it somehow just happened, that it somehow evolved. We, we've never seen anything that's intelligent, that exhibits the kind of design that the universe has, the sort of ecosystems and and the intelligence of the mind whereby I can think about what I'm thinking. That's pretty advanced stuff. If we saw a computer that would do that, we would never say, yeah, it just happened. But we do have to decide whether we're going to accept that because nothing else matters if God did not create the heavens and the earth. Now, he goes on, and in verse 2, says, the earth was without form and void. In Hebrew, that's tohu wavohu. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then we see these six days of creation. It's, it's hard to understand what it says. God created it, and then it was formless and void. It was an empty, destructive kind of spot. Now, there are a couple of different explanations of this. There are some people who would say simply, God created a formless mass, 
And then he used that to form it into the universe as we know it. It's possible. I don't know. There are other people who suggest that, you know, actually the earth was in a state of disaster at some point. And we can speculate. We, we don't know when the angels were created, but in Job it tells us that the angels watched while the sun, moon, and stars were being created. So they had to have been created for then. We don't know when Satan's fall was, when he rebelled against God. You would think that if he was cast down to earth, it might have done damage. So some people have suggested that Genesis is picking up from the point where, where Satan was cast out of heaven down to the earth, the mess that that made of the earth, and then God began to reform everything. Again, I don't know. There's, there are people who advocate what's called the gap theory, and these people basically take verse 2 and say there's an indeterminate period of time between when God originally created the heavens and the earth and when he began this restoration process that we see in Genesis 1 and 2. Pastor Chuck was someone who, who liked that. And I think part of the attraction of the gap theory is that as science begins to discover more and more that indicates how old the universe is, you kind of look for ways of saying, okay, creation doesn't lie, but it can be misinterpreted. The scriptures, we believe that it's God's inerrant word. So is there a way to sort of make these two work together. I, I'm old, but I'm not old enough to have been there. I don't, I don't know how old the universe is at all. Um, I, you know, just, there is, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, like over in Exodus chapter 20 and verse one, he says that God, when he's talking in the law, giving them the, the, the 10 commandments, when he talks about the Sabbath, he says they are to celebrate the Sabbath because God created the earth in six days and then rested. So that would have you believe, well, days are days. Now, the word yom for day isn't necessarily a day. Um, it can be used for a sp specific period of time. In fact, in Genesis 2 and verse 4, he says, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Same word as day one, day two, day three. So we just have to look at it and say, the most important point is that God created it, that there is a design and an intelligence. But I, I, I think that in order to be wise, we have to also look at it and say, but there's a lot of things he doesn't say. Now, people might say, well then, why couldn't God have created it using the process of evolution? Well, he could have. And there are some good people who love God, who, who respect the scriptures, believe it's inerrant, who believe that God worked through this process of evolution in order to strategically cause things to evolve with a particular design. I personally don't, at this point, share that conclusion because I just don't see significant enough evidence of evolution, of earlier forms turning into more developed forms. I, I, I see that the biggest argument for evolution is that when you see different, different life forms, you see that they share certain building blocks, certain elements. But to me, it's a long ways from that can be explained if they were all designed by the same person. When I, everything I've ever bought at Ikea was kind of the same. It uses those little screws and an Allen wrench, and whether it's a bookcase or a bed or whatever, they share design because they shared a design company. But I don't think that my bookshelf evolved from you know, our bed stand. It's, you know, so I think it's a leap to do that, but, but I don't have problem with people as long as they believe that God created the heavens and the earth. If they want to believe that he did it through evolution, there's a lot we don't know. I also don't have a problem with people who are 
young earth creationists. A young earth creationist is somebody who believes that the world as we know it is only you know, seven or 8,000 years old and that God created all of it in six literal days 7,000 years ago. And I, I can see that from the scriptures. I, could, I can defend that. I, you know, for many years, that was my assumption because it just seemed to do it. However, honestly, when I look at the evidence that the universe is much older than 7,000 years old, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be dogmatic and say that it has to be a young earth. To me, that doesn't matter. What matters is God created it. There are stars that we see in our sky that we know burned out millions of years ago, and we are just seeing the beam of light that emanated from a star that's been burned out for a long time. The only way I can explain that, if it's a young universe, is to say that there never was a star there, that God just created a beam of light to make it look like that that the ge geologic levels and everything were put there deliberately to throw us off and to make us think that the earth is old when it really isn't. And I don't know why God would do that. But to me, it's like I have no quarrel with young earth creationists. I have no problem with gap theory. I have no problem with um, you know, any kind of um, theistic evolution even. I may not agree with any of them, but I believe what the Bible says, that God created all of this and that there was a purpose behind it. And to me, that's the most important thing. Now, as you read through Genesis chapter 1, he, he starts out by creating day and night um, on the first day in verse 5. Um, obviously, to create day and night three days before you created the sun and moon and stars is problematic for us. The fact that he created you know, plant life before there was actually a sun in order to grow it. Now, you can make the case that, well, you know, it only needed to live for a day or two. And I'm not going to argue with that. But what that does is it takes away what's also called the day-age theory, that each of these days of creation was a long, undetermined period of time. I don't know how you can have day and night for a long period of time and have light before you actually have a sun. What is a day if we don't have our solar system? So when you're reading it, you at least have to go, huh, that is, that is interesting. That's challenging. And I don't think we should ever be dogmatic on how we interpret all of that stuff, but we have to keep coming back to we are the object of a created God. And as we go through all of these days of creation and God looking at all of them and saying it was good, and then finally, you know, on the last day, creating people, creating Adam and Eve, and saying that's very good. Um, you get the idea that However God created everything else, when he got around to humans, that was when he goes, this is the point of all of this. The people, the people that I love, the people that I desire to fellowship with. And so as you read through it, you can't miss that point at all. Um, in chapter 2, as he goes on and kind of reiterates some of the stuff, you get the idea that after Adam was created and before Eve was created, um, it took some time because Adam was given the job of naming all the animals. And he named all the animals, and it was through that discovery process that he figured out, hey, there's Mr. and Mrs. Elephant and Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe. There's no Mrs. Adam. And so, you know, again, it could have all happened in one day on the sixth day of creation, I don't know, but that's not something I would be dogmatic about. The point is, everything that exists was created by God, and he is a creative God. When God created man, he said, let's make man in our image. And if there's something that makes us as humans most like God and most different from every other animal, 
it is our desire, our drive, our ability to actually create things. And so I think that God, as a creative being, was creating people with that same capacity to create. Again, giving Adam the first job of coming up with new names for all these animals. God could have just named the animals easy. But, you know, he gave Adam that opportunity. And then he set them in a garden and he told them to, you know, to be fruitful and to enjoy the life that they had together. And God wanted to fellowship with them. And so he would meet up with them periodically and walk through the garden. And when you read through chapter two, you just get this beautiful sense of the world that God created as a place for man himself to also be creative. I think when we lose our sense of creativity, we start to lose something of who we are at the basis level. And that's why I'm concerned when our society becomes so much about functionality, about just productivity, and taking away all of the classes that give people an opportunity to, to look for things and have a fresh approach to things. And I think when we lose creativity, we lose a part of what we were created actually to do. Also think that God created people to live in a garden. He didn't build a city for them to live in. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You know, spread out. The first instance that we see of people trying to get organized and build a city was in Babel, where God ended up confusing their languages and sending them out because he didn't want them to, to miss the beauty of creation, the reality of creation. So he wanted them to spread out and to, to work with the soil and for man to go out and by the sweat of his brow to, to make a difference. And I think there's a lot of research nowadays that says our health is greatly related to our ability to get out into nature. It's really, you know, even 15 minutes out in nature, some studies have shown, is more beneficial to someone's sense of well-being than, you know, medication or than alcohol or other things that people use to try to calm themselves down. And I think we see it right from the beginning, and it's important for us to understand as the old hymn says, this is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. You know, it's, it's a beautiful place he created for us. And we see what you would expect, that when we turn the earth into vast remote regions, and at the same time, clustered, busy, humming cities, then we lose part of what we were created to be and to do. Uh, my wife and I recently were watching a special on the Ken Burns special on the national parks and John Muir, who was talking about as he got older, he ended up taking over managing a family business and, but he was just getting sicker and sicker and he finally just said, I think I need to get back out in the mountains. And so he went up to Yosemite and began to hike and his health completely was restored and improved. And I think when we're talking about creation, when we're talking about the beauty and design that is there in creation, we need to realize that that's something that's important. That's something that matters to God and, and it matters to us as well, it should. We shouldn't just be looking to exploit the planet. We should be looking for ways to appreciate it and to preserve it and to nurture it. Now, when we get into chapter three, we see what's called the fall of man. This is where they blew it. This is where they just made a big mistake. And, you know, it was, they had been told, live in the garden and you can eat anything in the garden that you want, except there's one tree, I don't want you to eat of that one tree. It'd be pretty easy to have one rule, you would think, 
but ultimately they broke the one rule that they had. And as a result, it seems like man has been destroyed um, forever. You know, until God sent his son Jesus to turn that around for us. And to, in Romans 5, it talks about how you know, God, um, excuse me, <clears throat> that God, through one man, sin entered into the world, and death passed on all men because all have sinned. But through one man, Jesus Christ, all can be made righteous. Everything can be reversed if, if we just understand that something needs to happen to change the flow of that which damaged it in the first place. So in chapter 3, the serpent was clever, and he came to the woman. I wanted to mention, too, that at the end of chapter 2, in verse 25, it says they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they weren't ashamed. They had no sense of self-consciousness. They had no sense of, you're different than I am. Than I am. They had no sense of competition. And what a beautiful thing that was for them. But the serpent came along, and with Eve began to stir up those things that they knew nothing of telling them, did God really say that you couldn't eat of that tree? And she said, yeah, he said, we can't even touch it or we'll die. He said, oh, you're not going to die. That's ridiculous. God is actually, um, you know, he's afraid that if you eat that, you'll be as good as he is, that you will become like a God. And he got her thinking that, hey, why is, why is God so concerned about not wanting me to know what I can know? Why is it that a tree of knowledge of good and evil is something that he wants to withhold from me? And so, sorry. So she begins to think about it, and she's like, it's a good-looking fruit. It would be nice to be smarter, nice to be like God. Um, if this would make me wise, I would love to have a shortcut because we're learning things every day. But man, if I could just know everything, have a Cliff Notes version, that would be awesome. So she took the fruit and she ate it. And then Adam took the fruit as well and ate it. Now in Romans Five, it tells us that it was through one man that sin entered into the world. Somehow, when Eve sinned, it isn't what messed up humankind. It was when Adam sinned, perhaps because he was the leader, perhaps because he did it knowing that he wasn't supposed to do it. Maybe if Eve had eaten it and went, oh no, what are we going to do? Perhaps at that point, the planet wouldn't have been damaged, but... Adam ate it also, and then at that point it says, they looked at each other and they knew that they were naked. Before they were unashamed. Now all of a sudden they're comparing body parts. Now all of a sudden they had a sense of, I'm embarrassed for who I am. I'm self-conscious. Something that they never had before. Something that really wasn't a part of their lives up until that point. Just a beautiful innocence and a being together. And then the craziest thing happens, you can read it there in Genesis 3. God shows up just to hang out, to walk in the garden in the cool of the day. And when he showed up, they were hiding. And they had you know, made outfits of fig leaves to try to protect them from being seen. What a sad thing. You're in a beautiful environment. You are completely loved. You have this pure connection to God. And yet, now it's competition. Now when God said, Adam, what are you doing? He blames his wife. That's a tradition that we follow ever since. 
she couldn't blame Adam. She ate first, so she blamed the snake. So God addresses the snake first, and he says, you're cursed, and you're going to spend the rest of your days sliding around on your belly. So perhaps at this point, the snake could walk upright. Now he's going to be in the dirt. But, you know, God also told him that someday you're going to find out that um, you are going to, a seed, singular, will come from woman, and that seed will crush your head, and you will just bruise his heel. Probably there in Genesis 3.16, probably a reference to Jesus, the seed of woman, born of a woman. And the fact that Satan wounded him, perhaps when he drove the spike through his feet to nail him to the cross, it bruised his heel. But when he did that, when he died, it crushed the head of Satan. His future was doomed at that point, and God predicted it. But then he said, Eve, life's not going to be easy for you. When you have babies, it's going to hurt. And now, I don't think we should... There are some people who think that oh, you should never have an epidural because it's part of the curse. Um, That would be like, later he says, weeds are a curse to Adam. And that would be like saying, you need to cut weeds by hand. You shouldn't use a lawnmower. Uh, If we can get to where you can have a baby without pain, that's not going against God. But the fact is, it's painful no matter what. But he says, and besides that, it gets even more painful after the kid's born. After the kid's a teenager, it's killing you. And... (laughs) It's like, yeah, that's, that's a part of it. You know, it's going to be painful. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a problem. And so he lets her know. And then she said, and he said, and yet your desire will be for your husband. Probably in the Hebrew, the idea there was you will want to be your husband. You will be jealous of him because of his position of leadership and you will be as much of a feminist as you possibly can. It's ingrained in you because of of the curse. And I, you know, you look at today, and women certainly desire special treatment because they're women, but they also want to be considered equal with men. I don't know why women want to be equal with men. I think women are way better than men and have a lot of advantages anyway, but we get such distorted thinking that we think somehow women are being sold short by not allowing them to go into combat and fight, for instance. I saw years ago one of my, one of somebody that I respect greatly, William F. Buckley, was, was debating on TV with Gloria Steinem, a, a famous, uh, notorious feminist, and, and they were arguing about combat and whether women should be able to go into combat. And, and Gloria Steinem said to him, how can you tell me as an American that I do not have the right to die for my country? And Buckley, as only he could state it, he said, Madam, I have no problem with you dying for your country. But the object of war is not to die for one's country. The object of war is to make someone else die for his country. And men are demonstrably better at that than women are. But see, we have this battle of the sexes, and it's a part of the curse. That there is something within all of us that doesn't want to be who we are. We want to be something else. It's not just women, it's true with men as well. None of us feel ever almost, we almost never get to a point where we're actually satisfied with the way our life is going. We're always looking at other people. We're always comparing ourselves to others. We are always living in a state of shame. We let other people judge us. We let other people decide what we are worth. We, you know, and it's so tragic when I talk to people who are absolutely, you know, falling apart emotionally and quite often, more often than not, people who are really in a distraught sense, it's because other people have made them feel like they aren't worth anything. Well, 
We've come a long ways from being naked and unashamed to where we are now hiding ourselves, covering ourselves up, pretending to be something that we aren't. The roots of mental illness come from an unwillingness to accept who we are. <coughs> that when we, do, when we do something wrong, that we don't just own up to it. Instead, we justify it. We try to cover for it. We hope no one noticed. Watch people when they're walking along and they trip. And you know, maybe nobody who even knows them is there, but we all do the same thing. We look down at the ground like, wow, there's something there when there isn't. It's just w w there's something within us that is so threatened by what other people think of us. And that started in Genesis 3. That started with the fall. We are destroyed because we just can't accept reality. And again, you know, as a, as a wise man has said, um, dichotomizing pathologizes and pathology dichotomizes. Abraham Maslow said that. Dichotomizing means living with a split personality. And pathology means being sick. And he says, when you live without integrity, when you live with a split personality, when you pretend to be something that you aren't, it will pathologize you. It will actually make you crazy. And conversely, crazy people will very soon begin to develop split personalities. And so, again, as Maslow says, dichotomizing pathologizes, pathology dichotomizes. The origin of that is Genesis chapter 3, when people decided that they wouldn't own up to who they really are, that they would cover their nakedness, that they would pretend to be someone that they aren't, that they would blame other people, that right away we would start grading on the curve. And so God told Eve, that's going to be a problem for you. And then he told Adam, you're going to work really hard by the sweat of your brow. It's just a part of that. I'm kind of battling sickness right now. Sorry, so I'm working and I'm sweating. That's why I had to sit down, but it's part of the curse. It's always been there. We're not, we don't have the ideal environment that we should have had. But the diet that God originally gave mankind, we have ultimately turned into where almost everything we eat is artificial and it's not good for us. It's causing a, a great increase in diabetes and heart disease. And for a lot of people, there are a lot of studies that indicate that much, if not most, cancer is made worse or is actually brought about because of the sugar that we ingest into ourselves. So God takes us from this perfect environment and then we go out and what we do is we want to live in the city and we want to live around people and we get away from nature. We get away from that beauty that still exists and we go, well, we're not in the garden anymore so it's time to go downtown. Even though with our economy and everything, maybe it's necessary for us to live around a bunch of other people. And certainly when Jesus came, he spent an awful lot of time in the city. But notice how Jesus left regularly to go out into the wilderness. You don't have to live in the wilderness, but you have to go there in order for you to be reminded of who you really are. I can tell, in fact, my wife can tell, when I haven't been down to the beach, or I haven't been up to the mountains, I haven't been to La Paz Regional Park to walk around the lake, or out to, I, we buy those OC Parks passes, if you're old like we are, um, 50 bucks, and you can go to all the OC Parks beaches, and all the parks and everything, and, but Anne can tell when I need to get out, and sometimes I take offense when she says that, I'm fine, I cover up, but the truth is, she's always right, and I would rather have something that fixes it better. I would rather go, all I need is a bowl of mac and cheese. <laughs> it's not that way. This world is messed up, and so we can't even recognize the blessing that the world is. Find a place that's your place to get away. If you're blessed with a yard, make a place there where it can feel like nature. It doesn't take a lot. If not, just live somewhere where there's a park with the 
Studies that they've done on people, uh, medical studies recently, several universities have undergone studies. They said that for someone to spend 15 minutes walking in a park, it is as good for you as being out away from everyone into nature. It doesn't take much for us to tap into who we originally were, but because we were damaged in the fall and sin entered into us, we inherited <coughs> this um, tendency that makes us not want to work in the yard, that makes us... You know, and there's a reason why the Mexican guys that take care of your yard are happier than you are, you know? And they, and they usually are. It's like they're actually out there doing something that, that God says, that's what you need to do to cope with the fall. The extent of what was damaged at the fall... We don't know. We know that Jesus has the possibility of reversing that. We get several indications as we read about heaven, as we read about the future, that we probably, at one time, like in the Garden of Eden, people probably had way more gifts and sensitivities and everything than we do now. We were damaged. We lost a lot of our capacities. I'm convinced that some people who you know, seem to have extra sensory perception. I'm not really quick to say, oh, it's just demons. I'm not going to blame demons for something that it just might mean that there's some ability, because most of us will have at one time or another, we just feel like God just tells us something about someone else. My mom, who just loved God and was, a, was an amazing woman, she had the ability to know things. And she, for instance, every time somebody that we knew died, she woke up and knew it. She knew that they had died. And we had a, a couple that were, like, we called them grandma and grandpa, but they had, you know, they, their kids were missionaries, one in Africa and the other in Thailand. And so they asked my mom to please take care of, care of them because they thought that my grandpa wouldn't live very long. But my mom woke up in the middle of the night and said, Birth is gone. And I'm like, what? But she had, she had died. And so we kind of, you know, adopted him as our grandpa. And it's amazing because before that, I hadn't spent nearly as much time out in nature as I did with him. He was a doctor, but he loved Yosemite. He loved getting out in the woods. And he would like, we would go to the beach or we would go to Yosemite with my grandpa and he would wear a suit and tie. But he had such an appreciation for that place and my mom just had a gift of that. Now, who's to say that the damage that comes from the fall affects people in different ways? And it's sad if somebody has a gift like that, and I think most of us are capable of having some sort of intuition at different times. How sad if we just act like, oh, you need to bind Satan. You need to go get anointed with oil. That's spooky. And there's so many things in life that we don't understand. And why not embrace them until something evil is coming from it? Why not just realize we were created for something better than this? We were created for a place that's better than this. And we really should be okay with that. We shouldn't feel like we have to have the answers to everything. But I'll tell you something. When the, the, and by the way, my theory is that biologically something happened to Adam and therefore to his children. As soon as they had kids, one kid killed the other one. You know, there was this competition. And I think that part of our sin nature is that there's something genetically damaged within us that is actually drawn toward doing things that aren't good for us. I think that with few exceptions, everyone I know has some kind of a bent toward self-destructiveness. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we find out that that was, a, that was a genetic deformity that happened because of whatever was in that fruit that he ingested that it could have actually literally created that damage. I don't know that for sure. You can think I'm crazy for that. But it would explain a lot to me. And why our bodies, which I believe these are the bodies that we are going to have in heaven, we don't trade in a body to get a new body. A lot of times people say that, and that's really, that is not resurrection. That is reincarnation. Resurrection is, as Job said, 
in with these eyes, I will see God. It's going to be this body. However, the reason people think it's a new body, and we use that term, I'm sure I do sometimes as well, ignorantly so, but you know, these bodies need to be transformed. They need to be healed. Um, it's interesting that Jesus, after the resurrection, still had scars, but it could be like, it's like in that one Mel Gibson movie, I forget which one it was, where he's comparing all of his bullet wounds with this woman cop who had been shot a bunch of times too. That might be the way it is. Man, I remember that scar. I remember that experience. But now in the light of eternity, it's not a threat anymore. But I believe, you know, Jesus in his new body, his transformed body, seemed like he was able to walk into the room without opening the door. It seemed like he was able to leave Jerusalem and go immediately to the Galilee. So no telling what our capacities are going to be and what, and what Adam was actually capable of. But let's just be aware that we are damaged, every one of us. And a part of that damage comes from our self-absorption. It comes from our obsession with competition and being better than others. It comes with our sense of feeling judged by others and then in turn judging others, grading on the curve, believing that we're better than other people. I really, boy, the last year or so, God really impressed upon me and where Paul said in in 1 Corinthians, he said, I don't judge, I don't let anybody else judge me and I don't even judge myself. I'll just let God judge me. That's so important because we were made to enjoy beauty. We were made to create. Now, whatever you believe about what that formless and void world was in Genesis 1-2, it would seem that God took that and formed it into the things that we know now, whether it was a devastated universe. Now, I didn't go into it, but there in in the Old Testament, there are scriptures that talk about, in fact, he, God says later in Genesis, I did not create the earth formless, tohu, the Hebrew word. And then in another passage later in, in Isaiah or Jeremiah, he describes God's judgment on the earth. And it says it was, there was nobody else living and it was tohu wavohu, it was formless and void. But God is able to make something special out of something that looks like it's been damaged beyond repair. And you will never be who you were designed to be until you begin to design, until you begin to create, until you take the time to do something that isn't of utilitarian benefit, just to write something, just to sing something, just to imagine something We were created to do that. And don't let the fall rip you off of being who you are as a human. We're also designed to be in fellowship with God, to be close to him, to walk in harmony with him, to appreciate the beauty of what he has made. And it's still here, as the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Shame on us when this world and science becomes something that we argue about instead of something that we stand there with our mouths hanging open just in awe. I don't even care about winning an argument about creation. I know my creator God made everything that I am just speechless when I look at it. I am so blown away. And even as I look in the mirror, seeing myself as a fallen individual, I know he looks at me because of what Jesus did to reverse the fall. And he says, I'm looking at you and what I see is something very good. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. As soon as we start arguing and debating, as soon as we start judging ourselves in comparison to others, we are falling into the original trap that robbed this earth of its beauty and of its power. So, I mean, I used to spend hours and hours arguing with people about creation. Now, I would rather spend that time in awe of creation 
and worshiping the God of creation. Job, he, he had lots of debates, imaginary debates with God as he was trying to figure out why God let him be sick the way he was and lose his businesses, his homes, all of his kids and his grandkids. And he, he, he was arguing with his friends about it. And God showed up. And I wish God had given him a great oratory philosophically to explain the problem of pain, to explain the theodicy, the problem of evil. But because Job asked great questions, we still have those same questions. But instead, God just started talking about creation and its greatness. And he says, where were you when I did this? Where were you when I taught the water to stay where it is and the land to stay where it is? Where were you when I designed these great sea creatures and these dinosaurs? Where, and he, he just went over what we would do with a little kid in a kid's book. And Job looked at it and he goes, my hand is over my mouth. I have nothing to say. An awareness of the magnificence of the fact that in the beginning, God created will silence so many of the questions that we've come up with since. And all the rest of history is God trying to bring us back to a garden. History begins and ends in a garden. And I'd suggest to you that every once in a while, find your garden, find your place, and instead of looking for answers, just bask in the beauty and the glory of our creator God who sent his son to give us a chance, who sent his son to just love us and to ultimately die for us so that we could be forgiven. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you. We can't imagine what the earth was like before the fall because it's just stinking amazing now. I can sit there by a man-made lake and be speechless. I can look at a tree and birds singing in it and flying by and just go, wow. When I wake up in the morning and I look out at the fog over the hills or the blue sky as it's starting to peek through or as I go to the gym and then I'm watching the sun coming up behind Saddleback and I'm, I'm just, I can't say anything that's, that your beauty is really, that my comments would be worthy of your beauty. But I know that ultimately... That is who you are. Help us to worship you as our amazing creator. Help us not to arrogantly think that we have all the answers and therefore we really don't need you. Help us to do what Job did, put our hand over our mouth and witness the beauty and the glory of your creation, of your love, and of your faithfulness to not let go of us when we have fallen and failed so miserably. Thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, hey, thanks for coming and bearing with me. I don't know how good the tape will end up being, but, uh, you know, I, I, I had to give it my best because I, I think this stuff is really important. We do need to know it. and So it's my pleasure to get together with you next week. If you want to come, some of us meet for prayer at 615. Feel free to join us if you'd like. No big deal if you can't. And we'll continue to dive into the things that matter most, the things that we need to know. Thanks again for coming. It encourages me. God bless you guys.